Welcome, everybody. I think we're uh, trickling in a little slowly today. Today is Sunday, April 9th. Today is the day. It's Second Sunday Readings. I've got three great readers for you today. My name is Sean Killingsworth, and our, our featured readers are Rebecca Evans, Matthew Thorburn, and Sara Ghazal Ali. And I'm super excited to have them all here. These are people that I have either been stalking on social media and following and reading their poems, um, or you know, I've, I've known Rebecca for a little while through other projects. So I'm very excited to present them all to you today. And before we get started into the actual poetry, um, I wanted to put a question to our poets today, because um, I know that often in these, uh, in these readings, we have a lot of other writers with us. And so I find it always helpful to ask about craft and we can have a little discussion for five minutes. So the question that I wanted to ask is, how do you get to writing, right? We're all busy. We have day jobs, we have kids, we have dogs, we have responsibilities. Some, some of us have you know parents that we need to look after. So how do you make the time or create the time or force yourself to sit down and, and let those creative juices start flowing? Um, anybody who wants to jump in, Rebecca, if you want to start first, that would be fabulous. Okay. Um, so I have to sort of trick myself and not plan to write. And I think planning and poetry and planning and serious writing just don't really go together. And I don't want to take away the joy from discovery and surprise in my writing. So I journal every morning. Um, my goal is just to figure my crap out on the page. So <laughs> I'm super vulnerable. And a lot of times in doing that, just a few minutes in the morning, I'll find little gems that I want to go deeper with. But I also feel like I try to live super intentional and fully. So I garden. I'm training all these Newfoundlands to be therapy dogs. I have a disabled son at home. Like I am immersed in life. And I think because of that, because I'm trying to be fully present, I have a lot of rich material to write from. So I think whatever you love to do, like do it with your full self, your full body, and then maybe jot down how it felt in your body, the experience. And then I think you have a well from which to pull with your writing. I think that's the richest writing for me. So I never plan to write a poem. They just kind of sort their way through. And then I start following them down the page and the art of the poem for me comes in the editing later um so that's my that's my trick <laughs> i pull myself into it <laughs> that's a good one uh, matthew or or sarah i know some people have like a, a a a file of sort of like lost phrases or lines from old poems that, well it doesn't work in this one but i'll keep it around and you know for me sometimes i'll go back and revisit that file and go oh this is a gem this is a great you know, fine, where can I shoehorn it into something else? Yeah, I, I try to do that sometimes. That's, I think that's a good, a good strategy sometimes, because I struggle with that too, with a, a busy day job and try to find time for writing. What I used to do and probably should go back to is I used to try to get up a little, like half hour, hour earlier and just write first thing, like sort of at the first best energy of the day. Um, mm. It's hard to keep that going. I did it for a little while. It's very hard to keep that going. That's assuming you uh, one has energy. <laughs> well, there's that too. That has also changed as I've gotten older. But yeah, yeah. Um, there's coffee. Co add coffee. coffee. Coffee helps. Yeah. Coffee is good. Yeah. Um, and I am a planner, just by necessity. So sometimes I will put on my calendar, like, put a block out. You know, this this half hour lunch or whenever to to try to look at a poem I'm working on. Sorry. It's been hard these days. I feel like I have been more consumed with editorial work recently and it's felt like I haven't really had time to sit down and just breathe and like feel that itch to write but what I've been trying to do now to make sure at least something is coming out is while I'm reading submissions for the two journals that I work with now I actively keep a piece of paper next to me so if there's like even if something is being declined or rejected there's always so much beautiful material in people's poems and it's such a privilege to get to see these early versions of them and these unpublished versions of them so now I write down images that I'm liking from other people's poems um, phrases words that I haven't heard of before um, it's really it's like your own little private dictionary um, but I'm being ethical but I'm not stealing anyone's <laughs> words but I'm using it as a way to just kind of mark what's standing out to me and what's 
what's sounding musical to my ear and just looking at that at the end of like a two hour submission reading spree also just kind of tells me like what my gaze is drawn towards that day and so that's been really interesting like oh it seems like today I was reading a lot of poems and noting that I was interested in all the birds in them and I'm writing down the names of the birds so hmm, okay maybe there's something there um, so that's been useful but I feel like getting a full satisfying poem out it's it's been a while <laughs> it's national poetry month and I'm seeing that all these people are doing these great poem a day things yeah. but that has been no not not yeah. right now <laughs> <laughs> those are hard those are really hard yeah I once participated in one of those you know 30 poems in 30 days things and it was oh gosh it was a slog so they're not for everyone <laughs> that is work it's amazing if you can do it yeah yeah um, Ooh. Some really great stuff comes out of those, but um, yeah, you have to really you have to have the mental energy, I think. But um, all right, well, speaking of mental energy and speaking of listening to lots of beauty and music, I am excited to hear some poems if you all are ready. Um, I think we're going to start with Rebecca. So once again, if everyone could please make sure they're muted. Um, so Rebecca Evans is a memoirist, poet, and essayist with two MFAs, one in creative nonfiction and the other in poetry from Sierra Nevada University. She teaches creative nonfiction at Boise State University, and in addition to writing, she mentors high school girls in the juvenile system and teaches poetry for those in recovery. She also co-hosts the radio program Writer to Writer. Rebecca is a disabled and decorated war veteran, a Jew, a gardener, a mother, a warrior, and more. She carries a passion for sharing difficult stories about vulnerability woven with mysticism. She lives in Idaho with her sons, her many dogs, <laughs> Newfies, and her calico cat. You can find her at RebeccaEvansWriter.com. So Rebecca, if you are all set, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And to be clear, it's warrior, not warrior. There's a big, di no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's a big difference. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to read from my new publication. It's called Tangled by Blood, and it's a memoir in verse. Um, so this, uh, this book does follow a narrative arc, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the poems in between. Uh, I do want to offer a trigger warning. So there is childhood um, sexual violence, but it is not vulgar or graphic, but I just want to offer you that so you can take care of yourself. Um, and so the, the poetry gets softer and nicer as I, the narrator, heal as a mother. Um, and the only other thing that you need to know is that there's some changing perspectives in this book. So there's um, the voice of the mother, the voice of, of course, the now narrator, the younger narrator, and then my adopted sister, Tina. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. One of the things that I hoped for as I was compiling this um, and orchestrating this book was to create poetry that spoke in conversation with each other um, because I wanted to keep the conversation of childhood sexual violence going. And so that was really important to me. So this first piece that I'm going to read, it comes back again in the book and I'll read how it changes later, the way that violence changes you or trauma changes you. Um, so this is entitled Mostly Garlic and Cilantro. I quit smoking. I started chocolate. I quit hot sauce, but added tiger balm to my neck at night. I quit weighing myself and purchased a scale for the puppy litter and another to measure my anxiety. I quit counting calories and carbs. I counted the number of friends still circling once I turned wilty and wise. I quit turning over a new leaf and decided old leaves can be ironed between wax sheets along with shaven bits of crayons, preserving autumnal beauty. I never quit coloring, but I quit shadowing my lids. I kept my reds of worth satin lipstick, I wore it while I wrote, believing my words improved with a respected L'Oreal gloss across my mouth. I kept my bamboo sheets, aloe socks, my hot tub beneath the Idaho star dripping sky. I wanted to smoke because I wanted a habit that felt normal, wanted the taste of something other than bile in my tongue. I quit swiping my pits with aluminum laden deodorant. 
I started noticing my aroma, mostly garlic and cilantro, not unpleasant, but who wants to smell like a main course first thing? I quit consuming chemicals through my skin, within my food, in the news. I started collecting volunteers, marigolds, rebirthing them near companion plants so maybe a community could be cultured, one that deters aphids and slugs. Okay, I never was a smoker, not a real one, but I tried. One time under the influence of angel envy, I smoked someone else's pack, flicked the ashes on a fake gas flame. I framed my beds with sprouted garlic and enticed predators, praying mantises and ladybugs to prey on the unintimidated creatures. I invited the pollinators, the honeys, the bumbles, and purposely deposited milkweeds, seducing the monarchs. I kept my hair long, told myself I looked either a mermaid or a crone. I kept my wardrobe and color-coded methods, organizing scarves and the tone of poetry and spices and yes, sometimes men. I embrace mid-50 invisibility. There's magic in remaining unseen and resentment once you understand you're unheard or silenced or worse. Though, what's worse? I quit praying for myself and started kneeling for the dead, the departed, the brokenhearted. I spilled my ink on square pages and gave spare change to Zadeka and lit extra candles and incense cinnamon with sage and cloves. I added cloves to coffee. I added more honey to bagels and oatmeal and chai and bruises and scabs and marigold petals. I quit trying to smoke. Thank you. This, this next piece is entitled Talking About Me. And um, like I said, there's a shift in voices throughout the book. And this voice is in the voice of um, the mother. Talking about me in front of me. She's such a big will. Too much for her own good, really. She's fine. Just look how she bites her nails to the core. See? Nervous, little, twit. Her twitches, one of many. Now, Becky, tell the nice doctor the real story. You need to tell the truth. She invents these fantasies, her way, her way to gather attention, see? Like this hospital stay. Honestly, I'm sure she's doing it already, you know, with schoolboys. I know, yes, yes, she's old enough. She's nine. Okay, we'll get a little relief here. <laughs> this one is called the Wildlife Protection Plan. So it comes a little later in the book and this revolves around motherhood and a little more healing. I tossed a rock with my son. It broke through the face of shallow lake, sinking, hide and seeking, behind bold cattails, breathing stark rays. Someone once told me submerging could cleanse me offer new starts, if only I believed. And I did, oh, how I believed. Water never worked that way for me. It rinsed me out, washed me over, eroded bone and breath, one ripple pulsing into two, then three, then many. Waves crashing, swelling my belly. Wanna skip those stones, my boy asks. And I do, oh. I really do, but I don't know how to skip anything. Certain I'll scatter like pebbles lining the ocean floor. A mottled mallard paddles through her brown speckled plumage breaking mirrored surface, her babies tugging to keep her steady pace. Wait, my son grips my wrist. We don't wanna hurt her. No, I say, and I mean it. Oh, how I mean it. Thank you. And in the center of this um, collection, 
is the voice of my adopted sister, Tina. It's a six part poem, but I'm gonna read just sections of this. So this is in Tina's voice and the title of the poem is I wanted to be your wall. And this is part four. Do you remember when I filled the bathtub cup with lukewarm water and washed your whitewashed hair? You said my caramel strands reminded you of silk toffee. I shield your eyes with the edge of my hand. It seemed we lived on the edge of it all in those simple lone moments, the only moments I could protect you, cover your eyes, keep you safe from the sting of soap. Thank you. And this poem, um, comes towards the end of the book and really like a, a poem about healing and rediscovering. Um, it's entitled, entitled, At the End of My Shrinking. In the end was the endless buffet when the buffet was crowded. In the end, I was crowded. In the end, I was empty and small, holding my child's stories when I wore granimals and later, I turned to fashion, crowded my closet, crowded my drawers, crowded my mind and my time and my planner and my dinner plate. I went back for thirds and fifths more than the other larger diners. But I stayed small, grew smaller and breastless and amenorrheic, purging every morsel up and out. I grew up and I knew, I knew that I was too small too silent with the boys because I was taught so well by the father who crowded my bed at night, crowded each crevice with his madness, crowded my heart in cloud and storm. I knew the difficult of loving, mostly myself. And so I shrank and shrank and shrank like those shrinky dinks you bake in the oven until they turn hard and half their size. I tornadoed through that oven door, wore the latest trousers, packed the popular tote, used fashion to hide my thinness, used fashion to hide. But that was the end. The end of crowds and buffets and perfectly matched granimal outfits selected by some adult who thought color coding clothes a good idea, but it prevented the child from choice and selection from her own voice. And that was the end. I am not my dinner plate or the size beneath draped dungarees or form-fitting gowns or spandex. Not the end, the end of my shrinking. I am a buffet. I am the latest fashion. I am my child story. I am thinness and thickness and granimal. I am. And thank you. And like I um, said, the poems, some of them come back and circle back around in new form or they're back and forth in conversation with each other. There's some that are golden shovels. Um, so there's poems where the stanzas show back up in different forms. So this is mostly garlic and cilantro. It comes back towards the end as a erasure poem. And so, and I feel like that's a lot of what happens with um, victims of trauma and abuse is parts of you are erased, but a lot of times what's left is just gold and treasure. And so this is mostly garlic and cilantro, God bless you, mostly garlic and cilantro um, as an erasure. I started weighing the puppy litter to measure my friends. I turned wise. I decided bits of beauty color my worth. I wore my words with respect. I kept my star. I wanted the taste of something pleasant in my skin, in the news. Okay, I never was an angel. I invited myself and poetry and magic in. I kneel for the broken. I lit candles and clothes. I added honey to bruises and petals. And then this, Thank you. And then this last piece is again from the um, 
center of the book in the voice of my adopted sister, Tina. And um, it's the last section of the section poem. So it's, I wanted to be your wall, part six of it, the six part poem. In our after time, I'd wrap you, sweet baby sister, curve you in my arms, wait till your heart slowed and your eyes slid low. Then I'd sing. You tell me my breath reminded you of buttered corn. And I pray, I pray my essence stay and linger with you. Thank you. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. What a treat. What a real treat. I'm so glad you're here today. Oh, and our next reader, if we're ready, is Matthew Thorburn. His most recent book is String, published by Louisiana State University Press. He's also the author of seven previous collections of poetry, including The Grace of Distance, which was a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize, and Dear Almost, which received the Lascaux Prize. His work has been recognized with a Witter Binner, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, fellowship from the Library of Congress, as well as fellowships from the Bronx and New Jersey Arts Councils. Originally from Michigan and for many years a New Yorker, he lives with his family near Princeton, New Jersey, which is where I grew up, and his poems, Dogs and Chickens, appear regularly on Instagram at Thorburn Poet. So everybody, let's listen to Matthew. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you all for being here. Um, this is um, really a pleasure. And thank you, Rebecca, for your reading. And, and Sarah, I'm looking forward to yours. Um, I'm going to read some. I'm going to unmute myself. I'm going to read some poems from uh, String. You can see it here in the light, but uh, it was just published um, a little over a month ago. And um, it's a book length sequence of poems uh, that's sort of like a novel in poems. Um, it's a work of fiction. And it tells the story of a boy's experiences in a time of war and its aftermath. Um, he experiences this as a teenager, loses pretty much everyone and everything, um, but he survives to tell his story. And so uh, the book is sort of like him, it's him as an adult, I would say, looking back, trying to untangle his memories and make you know some kind of sense of what he's been through. Um, so I, I would, I guess, also give a warning. It's not explicit or graphic, but it does allude to you know some horrible things um, that happen in this story that is a fictional story, but could certainly be you know could be true a lot of places and a lot of times. Um, I'm going to start with the the first poem in the book. There's a whole cast of characters, um, but I'll just sort of call them out as as they appear in the poems. Um, this poem, uh, and I should say that they're all in David's voice. That, that's the boy. His name is David, um, and this poem mentions Rosie, who's a, a somewhat older girl that he. Uh, has strong feelings for. Once there was crusty bread, a last half loaf, a rind of cheese. My parents danced in the empty kitchen. They knew we would never come back. They didn't know I listened in the dark. Brush and scuff of shoes, guttering candle. There was no moon. There was a broken oak, a silvery rain pooling in the grass. Once in the tall grass, there was a tan captain, chest smooth, pants unbuttoned. His holster amazed him by being empty. Rosie groaned, spat, clutched her wrinkled pink dress, pointed the pistol between his eyes. Between the trees, I saw how everyone dies. But once I was a boy who talked in circles, talked in circles. I walked in the woods. There was nowhere. I wouldn't follow her. Um, this next poem is, thank you, one of those poems. I don't know if anybody knows the term for this. It was one of those poems where the title goes right into the poem. I don't know if there's a word for that, but there's a number of those in this book. Um, and the title here is an Italian word um, that's defined in the poem. It's called uh, Pipistrello. Father called you in the old tongue used only with mother, which suits your jaunty dart and stitch, your glide and swoop much better than our flat, no nonsense bat. You sew up the night out and over trees, the pond, the field, you gather loose ends, you loop around again, zip and stir, swerve, strike, 
pluck bugs from air. You fly by ear, I remember the teacher taught us. I remember the teacher one night hanged upside down in a tree. Can I say you see with your ears are mostly fuzzed wings, then vanish as I would have, except I have none and nowhere to go. Now it's dusk and you one shade lighter than dusk. Oh, Bobbin, oh, Philip of fear, flying up, away, like the tailor's needle, a silver sweep and flash. You at home here in the dark, where we groped, we worried, we wished for light. And um, this, this next poem is uh, about the soldiers that come to David's town. And it's another one where the title goes right in. Um, it's called They. They like to throw things. A man down a well, a woman through a window. They like to know things. Names and dates, your hopes, what hurt, my hiding place. The combination to Saltzman's empty safe. They like to break things, doors, bicycles, legs and backs and necks. They like to take things, money, gold rings, fingernails and fathers. They had no need for her, none for me, except they were hungry, so hungry and so angry. Like shadows, they like to hide behind my back. They like to ride behind my eyelids. Death was their dark horse. They never stood still. Um, the, um, this book is a, about a war, but it's also, it's in the voice of a teenager. And, and in spite of everything that's going on, he's also a teenager who has, has fallen in love. So the poems are not all as, as dark as that. Um, although that's the, sort of the overarching story of the book. Um, but this one is, is a kind of love poem. It's called The River's Song. Um, and music and songs and singing all kind of run through this book and are one of the ways that David uh, tries to make sense of, of what he's gone through. The River's Song. I would sing you a sky of finger smudged glass, spikes of wild asparagus in the wet ditch beside the road. Rosie, roll out the piano, please. The old white upright in need of a tune-up. The yellow elbow of the river in what's left of the light. The river that remembers and forgets. A bright blade of light glances off the trees. The trees glance back. A bright blade. The river that forgets and remembers. In what's left of the light. The yellow elbow of the river the old white upright in need of a tune-up. Rosie, won't you please roll out the piano? Beside the wet ditch, beside the road, spikes of wild asparagus, a sky of finger smudged glass. I will sing you. And um, this, this next poem is called The Magician. Um, a lot of, quite a lot of what happens in the book is, is people being in this kind of situation and trying to decide, do we leave now? Do we wait a little bit and leave later? How do we get out of here? Um, and this, this poem just sort of glancingly deals with that, but, um, but does touch on that theme. That's called The Magician. The white rabbit popping out of a hat I loved best, so plump, it's sleepy stillness. And the bright rings that were linked, then not, then clinked together again. Like Rosie's hand, like mine, Held tight, then let go, the colored scarves. Red after blue, after green. A wave, a rope, like magic. The way they made me forget. The bomb splintered tree out back, its branches scattered in a halo. There was time for one last trick. The turbaned magician, his skinny assistant in her sparkly mask. Smile, a finger snap, and poof. They made themselves vanish, him and her, both at once. No one left to say ta-da. I squeezed Rosie's hand, heard her mother cough. In that darkness, I thought of grandfather, deaf in one ear. His left hand, mother would say, just didn't work anymore, too tired. I thought of his heavy walking stick, the newspaper folded on his chair, 
how it did not disappear for a year. It was the day he died. And um, this is a poem that uh, is about David's mother. Um, it's called Wouldn't Hold. Everything is made of loops, made of long lines, mother said, and it began to unravel the string of the world running out of my pencil. She taught me to hold on. Fingers pressure against wood could blur lead to shadow, show the slow darkening, a candle's flicker making strange angles of her face. She said it all fades, is lost to the horizon. She snuffed the flame and I was falling. I tried to slide inside my letters. P's open window, the low doorway of an H. But how could I know words wouldn't hold me? How could I know they close so tight? Um, here's another, a poem with another uh, character in it. There's a number of townspeople who appear in the book. Um, uh, and this, this one has a, a farmer in it called Old Schmidt who lives sort of near, near David, um, just outside of town. It's called The Barn. Old Schmidt clacked two sticks to tell his sheep it's time for bed. He smelled like a barn, mother said. Gray overalls, always muddy, always something filthy in his hands. A hoe, a rake, a snake, a dead bird. A wiry dog trotted alongside, dirty as he was, tin bell around its neck. So weird, familiar music comes drifting back. Bark, jingle, mutter, clack, and fades away. They were a little family. It's true. It's time, he called, time to go back over the hill into the barn, where he did sometimes drowse beside them, where he was happiest, there in the dry hay, the sagging gray barn. They locked up. They burned down one night, all the sheep inside. And um, I'm just going to read a couple more. These are a couple of poems towards the end of the book. Um, there's a turning point, I kind of alluded to this earlier, where David's family decides that they do, it is, it's time to go and they need to get out of there. And um, so David goes with his father to the train station and his mother is going to meet him there. Um, there's something she needs to do before they leave. So the plan is that she will meet them, um, but she doesn't come and he never finds out why or what happened. Um, it's one of the, the questions in the book that he just doesn't get to have an answer to. Um, so this poem is his trying to imagine uh, that she did get away and, and how that might have happened. It's called Where She Went. Mother tunneled under the fence, maybe caught the last bus, the last train. She flew away like the last lark. I haven't seen one for weeks. One foot in front of the other, she'd say. So maybe she walked away, climbed a hill, crossed the mountains. She drifted away the way a song does into your ear, into the air. She slipped under grandfather's black hat, left her reflection in the glow of Jean's clarinet. She swirled with the last hot water down the drain, maybe into the breath between buckets got a hole and keyhole blues. She cut the light, unzipped her shadow. I wanted to hold on, but father let go of her hand so she wouldn't disappear the way he did, wouldn't reappear the way he did, face in the mud. Um, and this, this next poem is an ekphrastic poem. Um, it's based on a, or inspired by a painting by Gerhard Richter called Stag. Um, and if, if you don't know that painting, I would encourage you to look it up. Um, it's, it's, really great painting. Um, it shows a dense forest uh, where a stag, a deer is um, maybe trying to pass through or maybe is stuck. Um, there's these very tangled branches that are very sharply drawn. And then the stag is sort of a gray blur um, kind of in the midst of all of that. Um, and um, I always think that it looks like it's, it's going to disappear or it's trying to disappear. Um, and so that in this poem, that's kind of a kind of an image for David or, or something that he thinks about. Um, this is called The Stag. I couldn't see a way out for him, the woods too tangled, 
Those arrowing branches pinned him in. One broad trunk weighed him down. No break in sight, no light shafting through. And what did you do? I lay still among the bodies. And how did you live? I played dead as the dead grew cold all night. And why didn't you scream? I did scream down in the dark. I kept it locked behind my teeth. And why did you close your eyes? So I could see the stag instead. His head turned to me. I watched until he blurred away into pale gray light. And why tell us this? Because I've grown old. Because my punishment for living is to keep living. And I'm going to read one last poem, which is the last poem in the book. Um, as, as Dave was trying to make sense of his experiences, he tries to imagine um, sort of if he could go back to before the war started or if he could live his life backwards. Um, and so in this last poem, he's sort of remembering um, what life was like before the war. Um, but then, uh, of course, the, the soldiers do come and the war starts um, because everything only really runs in one direction. So this is called A Girl Was Singing. Uh, she's not named in the poem, but the girl in the poem is, is Rosie. A girl was singing. Once a dog ran into the road and a girl hurried after him, calling Roger, Roger. As the mechanic struck a match on his boot sole, the butcher wiped his hands on his apron stained pink. Once in the field outside town, birds chattered and then a gun cracked, then silence, then the birds chattering again. Faint, but once a little string of notes, even this shy boy heard it. He let the sheet music drift to the floor, set down his violin, leaned out the window. Yes, a girl was singing below, and his lips parted too. I mean mine, it was me. Though I didn't know the words, didn't know her name, what would happen once I did? It was the first day of May. A train clattered by, not far away. Soldiers were coming. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Oh, what a wonderful reading. Such a great series of images and so much music. It's really a pleasure to listen. So thank you very much for coming. All right, our third and final reader is Sara Ghazal Ali. I've been following her on social media. Um, very pleased that she's agreed to join us. Um, she's the author of Theophanies, which was selected as the editor's choice for the 2022 Alice James Award and is forthcoming with Alice James Books in January of 2024. She's a 2022, and I think I'm saying this correctly, Janikian scholar. Uh, her poems appear in Poetry, American Poetry Review, Pleiades, The Rumpus, and elsewhere. She is the editor of Palette Poetry and lives in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, where she's a Stadler Fellow at Bucknell University. So everybody, please turn your attention to Sarah. Thank you for joining us. And Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself, we are ready. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Sean, and for putting this together. Um, Matthew and Rebecca, your readings were gorgeous. And it's also just really exciting to me that th those were both like larger project works. I think Rebecca, you said yours is a memoir in verse and then Matthew, yours is a novel in poems. And that's just so exciting. I love when people really dig in and the work is just continuously orbiting a subject or an obsession in that way. Um, so yeah, my first book comes out in January which I'm really excited about. And so I thought I would read a couple of newer poems that are starting to move beyond the first book, but then read a bunch of poems from that first book as well. Um, so this first poem, I don't really know how to categorize it. It's a love poem slash a climate anxiety poem slash a pre-elegy. I don't know. I don't know what to call it, <laughs> but it's called The Origin of Species. Passenger pigeon and eons are barreling forward. Before the wedding, our graves pre-purchased, vanishing a gift you say we should try to savor. Two children, should we have them? We've named ahead of time for the freed slave who called the Azan 
and a king who spoke the language of every creature, animal, or jinn. Should we have them? There are still those who remember when our creekside apartment was an ecotone, oak brush unchewed by goats who today crowd my window, trimming the reach of wildfires we've come to expect. Sleep is a minor death, a rehearsal in believing in some certain after. The redwoods keeping watch or score. Who was the last among us to see prophets in a dream? Mine long since privatized, mausoleums of oft polished bones, pinned wings with a surmised sense of sky. The cost of faith is the molting of memory. Years from now, earth all but effigy, the anthropologists will find us, our pixel-laden grins ossified behind glass. A tragedy began. A tragedy is beginning. When will the tragedy begin? So my book is called Theophanies, um, which is a term referring to the manifestation of God before people. Um, and they're very God-obsessed poems in this book, um, which I think is fitting, you know, in, in the spring and especially right now it's Easter and it's Ramadan and, and Passover. And I love when all these holidays are kind of converging and yeah, I'll just I'll leave it at that. Theophanies. A pair of apples blistering under the sun. My eyes have been so saturated. Before dream deep, I start awake, overstimulated by the stacking of my bones their caress and jostle. My granted days I could live or leave. Each loaned breath I can, do, waste or wield, straining for the bell in belief. How an arrow flees limb to pierce. How a pen bleeds to grant shape to speech. In each instance of angels descent, they soothe. Do not fear. O oh, Hajar, Mariam, vesseled thee? Or is it awe that clamors the flesh? A raptor's lean shadow for a flash obliterating the high noon sun. May it be done to me so clearly, like sirens, like chimes. I'm really interested in the original Sarah or Sarah that I was named for. So a lot of the poems in this book consider that first Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and then Hodger, her handmaiden. Um, and so this poem considers, it's a persona poem in the voice of Sarah before God changed her name when it was still Sarai. Sarai. A name is not unlike a sexed body. Like mine, it carries is remembered most for what it fails to yield. A name is a condition meant to last, to outlast, as should a daughter, her mother tongue. I am, but do not have a daughter. When I look in the lake, who looks back is a sister self. Oh, little I, I carry you as you carry who I'm waiting to be. And another Sarah poem. This one is a pantoum, which is a really great and difficult to write repetitive form if any of you have tried before. They're so hard, but really exciting when you get it. <laughs> Mother of Nations. By now it's almost boring. The peal of Sarah's bewildered laugh. The sidelined matriarch, barren until she wasn't. I pretend not to hear Sarah's bewildered laugh. How does a barren tomb sound, waiting until she wasn't? I pretend to be honeycomb, sucked clean, scraped raw. The sound of a barren tomb, waiting each month for the inevitable wilt of a cervix sucked clean, scraped raw. Hodger had it easy 
until she didn't. Sprouting, spared the inevitable monthly wilt. Sarah's throat plumed right in God's face. Hodger had the easy job until she didn't. But enough, it's boring watching Faith peel. Fatal music. The leaves of the fig tree are lobed and bright. In another country, they shade me before I learn to register them. Faith follows me like this, never heavy and whole with or without me. At dusk, I walk through an orchard and choir its fruit into the basin I make of my blouse. I love most that object which evokes another. How the split fig on my tongue leaks honey, gummy resin of eternal rivers. In the other country, I begin to impersonate a more desirable self, a penumbra. From mosque to mosque, I carry a book of elegies. A purple shawl I pull shyly over my hair. What is it you urgently ask for if not transformation? How, um, how hungry my gaze is to swell, but the angels are indifferent to me. In home videos, my child self presses her face to the camera and asks over and over, are you looking at me? Seeing her face erodes something in mine, though I finally groan into her eyes. The angels elsewhere tune their instruments, polish their preludes. What they blow with their breath will make a song of death. For the trumpet shall be blown, and whosoever is in the heavens and whosoever is in the earth shall swoon, save whom God wills. Then it shall be blown again, and lo, they shall stand beholding. Quran 39, 68. An orchestra then, a cataclysm that tunnels through the ears, and I still foolishly beholden to the sugar of each sclera. Once, a winged thing pressed hot coal to Isaiah's lips. Once, a swarm of feathers shielded the someday prophet from view as hands pulled apart each rib, fished out his heart, and polished it. Ikra, gul, reed, say, but I'm stubborn, red-eyed, waiting for a different imperative. So much could lie beyond the lattice of this language that I finger but cannot unlatch. How full a tender fig in my palm before I've bitten it. How sweet the fruit of a soil I was born beginning to leave. And here's another one of the title poems, Theophanies. If nothing else, at least this clemency, two whirls in each face, round pistols burrowed and searching. Tharic asks what I saw in my sleep. I weave a sweet lie about my mother's pomegranates, the kitchen tiles we bloodied, searching for the seed in each rumored to belong to a mirror tree in paradise. The truth, a girl with melting eyes who holds my gaze all night, vitreous rivers gushing down our faces, until one of us wakes. There is no unseeing it. The whites, thick and clotted, erupting into weeds where they fall near my feet. My people don't share what darkness we've seen. Fear always a message from the devil. Tharik says true dreams reveal themselves at the first inhale of sunrise. How to hold wide my eyes for the ineluctable light on a disappeared horizon, a bush continues to burn, a lilied cervix swarms green, and Jacob is still sightless, 40 years lost to grief. Clouds drone above me, my two ordinary eyes sealed in sleep. Every vision is redolent and terrible. Every temporal sight, either a miracle or mistake. And then I'll read just one more poem that 
isn't from the book. Recently, I've been trying to write more about my obsession with the image um, and what that means as a practicing Muslim who believes that we don't need the image of God. You know, like Islamic art doesn't really do that. We don't paint religious figures or um, things like that. And so there's like this tension where there's nothing that I love more than Christian iconography. I'm so drawn to it. Um, but at the same time, I'm trying to ask myself, like, what would it mean to write a poem that resists that kind of imagery? Or what would a poem even look like if it didn't have any imagery in it? Um, every attempt to write such a poem has been a complete and utter failure. Um, but it's been fun trying. Um, um, <laughs> so the best I could do is this poem so far that's about um, this struggle, I guess, overall. So this is called Ism. The name of God is sufficient for me. Merciful, beneficent, I want to want little else. I shouldn't say that I'm there yet, wanting little else but the name. Not when nothing flusters me like an image, Mount Tumalpais and acrylic salmon and sage, the hue, the brown eddies of my own eyes, every staggering sight. But I hush them, my zealous eyes. I recite. Said the angel, recite in the name of your Lord. I come from a people who begin with the name, who absent the face, who efface and know it faith who say bismillah before breathing, before leaving. The name is in the name, ism, which means in the name in Arabic. You see, I don't see to believe, don't desire a babbling bush or shrinking sea halves. I'm trying not to worship my eager eyes. Doesn't the mantis shrimp see more color than any other creature alive? A poet says our long gone loves remain lateral, unseen, but quiet beside us, perhaps. I admire that belief in a love that doesn't leave. Here ism, or remain ism, more convincing an ism that beckons than inflicts a rift. I believe in the weakness of my species, the lore of our many malevolent isms. I won't name them. For love of the name, I learn instead all that I can of what grows softly without seeking praise. O oh, linden, lichen, mulberry under ripe, fragrant fisted peony, O oh, flower medicinal, emollient aloe, I call you by your name, Bismillah, O oh, divine unseen, whose name I know, Ism of isms, remain here, invisible, and I will call to you, crouched, recognizing each green by touch, by name, by sense unseen. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was just lovely. Ugh, I feel so totally lucky and a little smug that I get to host so many wonderful poets month after month. And this month has not, you know, it hasn't been any exception because it's always just one great poet after another. So thank you all, Rebecca, Matthew, Sarah, thank you for joining us on this Sunday afternoon. I'm not sure where everybody is, but where I am, it's four o'clock and um, it's been a lovely April reading. So thank you so much. I, I want to encourage everyone who has attended to go seek out more of these poets work online. Um, everybody, I'm sure, is uh, on some sort of social media. We've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, and um, seek out their books. Sarah's book will be coming out in January, so everybody go buy books because that is how you support poets. And uh, quick congratulations to Stephen Roberts, who just got into an MFA program. He is one of our very loyal readers, and I'm super excited for him. Uh, readers. He's an attendee, I should say. He's been with me from the beginning. So congrats, Stephen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I accept it on Friday. So yay. So all right. Well, thanks everybody for an awesome Sunday reading. I'm so grateful to you all for coming. And that's all. So have a fabulous rest of your day and we'll see you next month.
Take care, everybody.